Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, great to be back here. Uh, I think I have come to all of the Asian Association meetings for the last, uh, I don't know how many meetings. Uh, it's always great to come here to see old friends and to uh, meet uh, new friends. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, giving a plenary uh, lecture. So um, today I just want to uh, talk about the, the technical and technological advances uh, in thyroid surgery. It's sort of a fun talk and I hope uh, you all enjoy it. Uh, it will be a bit of a whirlwind uh, review of, uh, of what we know about uh, thyroid techniques, uh, thyroid surgery <coughs> techniques and technology. Uh, so yesterday we heard from Rapa that the, the Arabic surgeon uh, Al Qazim was the first documented operation, but I actually find it in the Chinese textbook. The Chinese uh, beat the Arabs by 15 years uh, in <laughs> doing, uh, doing thyroidectomy. Now, of course, the one that's most well known uh, is uh, from the school of Salerno, uh, Roger Bugatti. And uh, this is just a description from the textbook about how they did a thyroidectomy. They put a hot iron right through the goiter, put a suture through it, and tie it, start tying it like a sea top. Those of you who do uh, anal rectal surgery would know we use sea top there for anal fistulas, and it can be quite painful. And then this way, slowly cut through uh, the thyroid, and that's how they did the operation in the old days. And, and this technique, I think, was in use for quite a long time from the Middle Ages until uh, basically to 18th, 19th century. Now somewhere between then and now, uh, this is uh, in my operating room. Uh, I pull off some instruments and here are the names. There's Coker, there's a Halstead hemostat, there's a Mayo clamp, there's a cryo, uh, there's a Leahy retractor, and this is how I do my operation. Now, I found this wonderful article that talk about the magnificent seven of modern thyroid surgery. Now remember, all of those instruments are also instruments that we use just for regular general surgery operations. They're not specifically for thyroid operations. And yet, they're named after some of the giants. Uh, so these are the, the seven magnificent, the magnificent seven of my, uh, modern uh, thyroid surgery. Now, the, the earliest one is uh, Theodore Gilroth. Now, Bill Roth actually did a, did, had a terrible result early on. Uh, he had 40% mortality rate. Now, nowadays, if you have 40% mortality rate in your hospital, uh, the QI committee will for sure come after you and you have to start doing the operation. And he actually did because he had eight <coughs> patients die and seven, seven of them died from sepsis. Now keep in mind, this is early on, so this is before the days when antisepsis and asepsis technique were being used. He subsequently went back to thyroid operation and was able to achieve the mortality instead of 40% to below 10% and, uh, and, and actually continued to do thyroid operation and subsequently taught Michelin and Wolfer to also modify the technique. And so he sort of started the modern thyroid surgery. Now the one that we all know the best is Theodore Coker. Now so, or you all know that Coker won the Nobel Prize uh, in, uh, in 1909. And one of the amazing things, if you think about it, is this. This was the day, it, it, these were the days that they did not even know that thyroid hormone exists. And if you look at the picture on the right there, um, Coker basically realized he saw a patient that he operated on at age 11. And eight years later, that patient uh, was hypothyroid. Now, he did not know that the patient was hypothyroid, but he knew that something was wrong because he took out the whole thyroid. And he called the condition Cacacea truma prima. You can compare the patient who was hypothyroid with the younger sister, who eight years later became a, a full-grown woman, and yet the one that's hypothyroid looked terrible. So with this, he actually went from total thyroidectomy back to subtotal thyroidectomy. He was one of the first to do total thyroidectomy, and his operation was so good that he discovered hypothyroidism. Whereas Theodore Coker did not see hypothyroidism because he was much faster, 
they left a lot of firewood behind. But Coke, uh, 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 Bill Roth, uh, had no hypothyroidism, but lots and lots of hypoparathyroidism. Now, the next uh, famous thyroid surgeon is uh, William Stewart Halstead. Now, Halstead is the one that, that made this quote that all of us uh, thyroid surgeons like to say is that thyroid operation is the triumph, the supreme triumph of the surgeon's heart. If you're a good surgeon, you know how to do a thyroid without killing your patients. Another thing that many people do not know is that he was really the special uh, person in describing parathyroids and how to preserve parathyroid. Uh, this is the paper that he wrote uh, with the Californian, actually, named Evans. Describe the parathyroid vascular anatomy as a cherry on a stem. And that's how I teach my residents. Think about your thyroid gland. It's a cherry on a stem. You don't just preserve the cherry. You need to make sure that the stem is preserved so that there's blood supply to it. And so that's all stem. Now the next three, Charles Mayo, George Quayle, and Frank Leahy, these were giants in the <coughs> days and they all became famous because of their ability to do good thyroid operation. And actually, Frank Leahy was one that uh, was really the first to emphasize that you need to see the recurrent laryngeal nerve well to preserve it. And guess what? All three of these went on to uh, found clinics, that the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and the Leahy Clinic. So all these named famous clinic in the United States came from surgeons that are thyroid surgeons. Um, Thomas Dunhill is actually my favorite of all this group. And of course, uh, he's, he's Australian from Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go, Jim. So uh, I think we're going to be in Melbourne two years from now, so I can talk about the story again. He was a very famous Australian thyroid surgeon, and he was one that was so brave that would operate on these patients with terrible heart and, and, and huge goiters and etc. Uh, but he is known to us for his dunkel procedure, which is a unilateral lobectomy and a subtotal uh, uh, lobectomy on the contralateral side. He was so good that he uh, went to Britain and he became the surgeon uh, to the royal household, to the kings and queens and princes and the princes of, uh, of Great Britain. But his most famous operation was not a thyroid operation. His most famous operation was an inguinal hernia that he did on Winston Churchill. And this repair actually lasted until uh, Churchill's death. And however, the interesting thing is that they were general surgeons that criticized that as a, as a general surgeon, Dunhill was too old and too slow. That his inguinal hernia operation took two hours. In those days, apparently, it took only 20 minutes. And if you look at the last line there, that his surgeon might not have been the best choice since Dr. at this time was 81 and he was a thyroid surgeon. So, but as you, those of you that do hernia repair will probably know that when a thyroid surgeon do a hernia repair, it will be slower, <laughs> but you will, you will not lose any blood, not like the regular general surgeons. So if you uh, look at this, in the late 19th century, the problem that the surgeons were trying to deal with were sepsis with infection, uh, like uh, 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 you know early on, and then bleeding was the next. Then in the 20th century, as these giants of thyroid surgeon uh, begin to, to perfect the technique, the, the problems were hypothyroidism, recurrent nerve injury, hypoparathyroidism. And, and they still plague us nowadays, although not as much as it was before. And we'll talk a little bit about now into earliest 21st century, we begin to worry about cosmetics of the neck, about scars. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, hemostasis and bleeding. Currently, the overall bleeding risk for thyroid operation should be less than 1% in terms of hematoma. And I put down a list there of what are the kinds of things that tend to increase the risk of bleeding. This is a very good article with a uh, review uh, from uh, Dr. Campbell. Now we all know Bovi, and but some of you may not know that Bovi invented Bovi, which is a model called polar cautery, uh, working with uh, Harvey Cushing. 
And Harvey Cushing actually is also an endocrine surgeon, except he operated in the pituitary, so somehow we don't count him as an endocrine surgeon. And uh, Bowie, during the uh, uh, development of, of his Bowie, actually electrocuted um, Cushing's. And, uh, and early on, uh, he developed this at Hopkins. But those of, the, those of you that are old enough that, that the East Coast people did not like to use monopolar cardio at all. I remember uh, talking to uh, uh, Norman Thompson once and I showed him a videotape of my thyroid operation and he was horrified that I used monopolar cardio and I used it so close to the nerve. And so people in the East Coast used to call the Bowie the West Coast barbecue. And he, he liked it so much, he sold the patent for only one dollar so that everybody can use it. And nowadays, and most of us, uh, monopolar cardio, we call Bovi, and it's a very standard thing that we use. Now currently, some of the newer technology, uh, new energy sources that you heard about in some of the talks here, that begin to allow us uh, to do the operation. When I was a junior resident learning how to do thyroid operation, it was not uncommon for me to do 200 silk ties in a thyroid case. Now we do zero. We do all these operations uh, almost always with energy sources. Now let's go into nerves. Uh, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, this is uh, Galen when he uh, uh, demonstrated the recurrent laryngeal nerve by having a, squeak, a squeaking pig. Uh, this is in wrong, and then he would go in and stick his head in and cut the nerve, and the pig would stop squeaking. And it's a sort of like a magic show uh, for this. But in those days, they actually thought both Galen and subsequently uh, uh, Leonardo, they thought maybe the nerve worked as a pulley. That's why you have a recurrent nerves like a pulley, but obviously they did not know about electrophysiology. The other nerve is the uh, Abelita Galakirchi nerve, and actually, Radan and I were talking about this yesterday. It was probably a mistake that we attributed the fact that uh, Galakirchi could not sing mezzo-soprano anymore in her 50s uh, due to the operation. Probably just because she was getting old. And, and when you get older, you just cannot sing that kind of high note anymore. But it makes a good story. And so we call it the Emily the Galakirchi nerve. Now, we have new technologies to evaluate these nerves. Most of you probably use uh, various types of uh, nerve monitoring uh, that you can do. And now keep in mind, however, there's really very little level one evidence for the use of recurrent laryngeal nerve monitoring to prevent nerve injury. And today, this is still the biggest series. This is uh, from Hanindrella, and this is uh, 14 years old now. They review all the German, uh, it is a retrospective review. Uh, of German surgeons. And in the end, what they found is what Frank Leahy taught us, that the most important thing is to identify the nerve. If you don't identify the nerve, your uh, rate is 40% higher. But if you use a nerve monitoring, it actually makes no difference in this particular series. Now, there are other reasons to use it besides trying to protect the nerve, and probably in a subgroup of patients, nerve monitoring is quite useful. Now, to tell the truth, I actually use it for all my cases, but some of it is for teaching. The only good uh, prospective randomized study is a study from Bazinski, where he found that the temporary nerve injury rate in a complex operation, there appeared to be a statistically significant difference between 5% and 2.7%, but this is only for temporary injury. So this is probably the only study that has good prospective randomized study. Now, other things, however, we discover and learn or relearn from use of nerve monitoring. So this is a thing that I call the Serpel's rule. So Jonathan Serpel uh, described that if you see bifurcated nerves in your weak laryngeal nerve, the anterior nerve is the important uh, motor nerve. So it's, it's good to know that, and, and they're actually quite frequent, you can see how often you can see bifurcated nerve. It's always the anterior one that's important. Now we just heard a little bit about non-recurrent laryngeal nerve. Again, you can find these with nerve monitoring. But nowadays we know even better than that. We know the reason you have non-recurrent nerve on the right side is because of vascular anomaly. 
the amount of recurrent nerve on the right side is almost always associated with the abnormal origin of the right subclavian artery because that's the nerve, that's the vessel that your nerve hook around. So, uh, and nowadays frequently people get CT scans or preoperative ultrasound. So most of our non-recurrent marital nerve that we see currently, we know it before we go to the operating room. So if you have a CT scan and you say, gee, the right, right subclavian artery come from the wrong place, that is a patient that you will see a non-recurrent recurrent nerve on the right side. So keep that in mind. So nowadays, again, uh, uh, the, the guidelines basically say that we really should identify the nerve. If we want to use nerve monitoring, that's good. But the data is not that clean. So this is a country data that's published by Mary Hart, who is, uh, uh, was in Alabama before, but she's now in uh, Stanford as a chair there. And they uh, did a review of uh, a big databases, and they actually found that use of neural monitoring is associated with increased vocal cord paralysis. Now, all of us would know that this is really a patient selection issue, but again, there's really no good proof that using neural monitoring improve uh, the uh, vocal cord paralysis. Uh, there are many of us now also use uh, continuous nerve monitoring. This is just one of the drawings I show you that uh, with nerve tr uh, with traction uh, by uh, 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 stretching the nerve, compression the nerve, you can see in real time that you're doing something bad to the nerve, so you can stop. So it's a very interesting technique, very instructional uh, technique, uh, learning. Uh, how you be operating and how you may be affecting the nerve. But not everybody uses it in the United States. In fact, there's been quite a bit of concern. Uh, this is a paper from Dave Terrace who described uh, some injury to the vagus nerve uh, when you do these uh, continuous nerve monitoring. So there's still quite a bit of debate as to whether or not one should use continuous nerve monitoring. At UCSF, of the five people there, I'm the only one that do continuous nerve monitoring, and I only use it for big goiters, because there I cannot get to the recurrent nerve until very late, so it's nice to have the vagus nerve monitoring, and so that I can tell before I get to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, I know that things are okay. Um, uh, other technology, actually this is one of the newer things, that is very commonly used now in the, in the United States by the endocrine surgeons I don't know about in Asia, although this come from Asia. It was initially described in Taiwan and then subsequently popularized by people from Hong Kong, is to use ultrasound to look at your vocal cord function. So for those of you that don't like to do uh, uh, laryngoscopy for evaluating your vocal cord, you can actually use ultrasound. And it works quite well. We, we do it in the clinic routinely. Although if we see something abnormal, we almost always confirm it uh, with the laryngoscopy. Now we talked quite a bit about uh, parathyroid and how to preserve it and the cherry on the stem and all that. So uh, currently the, the two newest technique uh, that, that's uh, uh, it's beginning to be on the market now of identifying and to help preserve parathyroid gland is to use a near infrared <coughs> And as it turns out, your parathyroid gland has different uh, uh, composition such that if you shine a laser light of a certain frequency on it, you would re-emit near-infrared at a particular spectrum. And so you can put a scope in there and you can tell what your parathyroid is. You would light up. And uh, I think the, the, the machine is called Flow Beam. So you use it without any kind of contrast. Just look at it and you can see the parathyroid gland, you can identify the parathyroid gland. Uh, the one on the right is ICG, and that's a different technique. In that technique, you inject ICG dye. Now, those of you that do general surgery, uh, many general surgeons are using this for gallbladder operation, where they can identify the gallbladder vessel, etc. And you use the same technique, the same skull, is again, you inject ICG and you get fluorescent. The, the two differences is that the ICG technique, you can actually see the blood vessel. You can see the stem of the cherry. Also, if you devascularize that, 
the parathyroid or the cherry will no longer light up. So there are different kinds of techniques. One is to identify whether or not it is a parathyroid. The other one is to identify whether or not the tissue that you see is vascularized. So some people are using the ICG technique to decide whether or not to order transplant, for example. We are beginning to use a near infrared or fluorescent on the specimen to just make sure that when we look at the specimen, there's not a little bright dot there that we need to take out and order transplant into the patient. So keep, it, keep an eye on these techniques that they're going to be uh, used frequently. Uh, many of us also use uh, endothyroidectomy at intraoptic PTH. It's still relatively controversial, but the majority opinion is that at the end of the case, or maybe a few hours after the case, if you check a PTH in a thyroid case, and the PTH is lower, low enough, then that patient is at much higher risk for transient or permanent hypoparathyroidism. I mean, in our center, our, our, our upper normal is 65, and if we see an end of case PTH lower than 10, we worry a little bit more about those patients. For example, we will give those patients calcitriol, whereas all the other patients, we just give them calcium. So it's, it's a reasonable thing to do. It's not an absolute predictor, but you can get a sense whether or not the patient's going to be at high risk. Now I have one minute to tell you a little bit about minimally invasive thyroidectomy, and now I'm just going to, going to go through this really fast. The most commonly used one in Europe is a MEVAP technique. This is a polymically technique, small one centimeter incision, go in with the scope. It's a very easy technique to learn. The biggest problem is that it requires three surgeons, so it makes it hard to use in practice. So we don't do it anymore, but it's a very good technique to learn. Other endoscopic technique, I think that the, the Japanese surgeon initially develops, but this is used quite often uh, in, uh, in Asia. Uh, if you go to uh, places like Vietnam, like Thailand, this is used quite commonly. Um, the, using scope through the breast and through the axilla, this is more popular in Korea and in China. In fact, in China, this is probably the most popular technique. It's called the Baba operation. And uh, this is uh, Wun Yun uh, Chong's uh, procedure. I think they do, they've done probably 5,000 of these now from Korea. This is uh, using a gasless lifting technique from the axilla, use a robot, and it's a robot-assisted uh, transaxial technique. Now, in the United States, uh, people have tried this, but in the U.S., this is no longer done uh, by more than one or two uh, centers. And then uh, this is Dave Terrace. Uh, he, does something called the facelift technique. So he makes an incision in the back and you can lift up the... So all of these are to prevent, to avoid incision in the neck. And they have uh, different people that are trying out these things. Uh, however, there have been some uh, robot-associated problems in thyroidectomy in the United States. And so uh, in about 2011, the FDA, uh, uh, well, the intuitive uh, uh, company tell you that you cannot use a thyroid for, um, uh, you cannot use a robot for thyroid operation anymore. And in fact, you can see the dip there in terms of number of cases since that happened. So uh, the use of robot for thyroid operation in the United States has not really recovered, and it's really in very few centers uh, that's been done. So, uh, the other more interesting technique, this is a, uh, through the mouth. This is a real nose operation. Those of you that do en uh, endoscopic, laparoscopic operations, the best note operations are thyroid <coughs> operations. This is the original German technique, floor the mouth, very painful, lots of complications. Uh, very few people do this now, except uh, in southern China, quite a few people are still using this. This is the original transoral vestibular technique from Japan. The trouble with this, if you look at that cut there, they cut the mental nerve when they do this. It's a lifting technique, so this is also no longer used. But this technique has been modified by An Kun uh, Anuwan, who is in Bangkok. Now, An Kun now has done about 800 of these cases using three incisions from the, uh, from the mouth just in front of the teeth. And if you look at that, you say, oh my God, for sure you're going to get infection, you're going to get all kinds of trouble. But if you look at the, uh, this is the biggest series that's published, but he's up to about 800. There have been no infection 
So the, one of the biggest fear of doing transoral is infection, but there's been no infections. So now we do all of these mainly to avoid a scar, like this is the president of, of Argentina and showing off her terrible looking scar, but most of us actually the patient has reasonable size scar. So, so it's still, and this is the patient 13 years later, you can't tell there's a scar in the neck. So I think it's, it's still, you know, once you have to think about whether or not that we should be uh, doing these operations, but if we do, we're really doing it for the cosmetic. And one last thing I want to tell you is an operation we call it Pokemon Go. Now, uh, those of you not in the United States probably don't know what Pokemon Go is. The children will take, a, uh, take the iPhone, and it's a virtual reality. They will see the background, which is real, but they will see these Pokemon uh, characters in there. So the Pokemon Go operation is that you do CT scans or other scans of the structures that you want to see. Then you superimpose it on the patient. And so if you put on a pair of goggles or put on it with a scope, the surgeon can actually see through the patient and see all the structures in there and do thyroidectomy and pemethyridectomies. So, last slides. Technical and technological advances uh, in thyroid surgery, although basic thyroid operation has not changed in the last 100 years, the technical and technological advances have improved our ability to prevent complication and modify our approach to thyroid glands. Thank you very much.